Anthony Taylor, the host of Leaders Lead the Podcast. We are going to have an amazing show today. That's because we have an amazing guest. That's because you're here and you're amazing. So we're going to have a good time. Do me a favor, light up the comment section. Let me know that you're here. Type in the word here and also tell me what state or city or now country that you're listening to the show from and uh, share the stream with your friend. This is going to be a really good show. Hey, what's up? I'm Tony Taylor. Are you here for Leaders Lead the Podcast? Let's go. Hey, how did you beat me? Look, let me tell you about this podcast. We got like five seconds. Leaders Lead the Podcast is about leadership. Not just the leader without, but the leader within. All of these leaders that I'm talking to across the country, well, across the world now, they have one thing in common, and that's that they have overcome some insurmountable obstacles to get to where they're at today. Come on, let's go. Hey, hey, welcome to Leaders Lead, the podcast. This is season two episode two. I'm super excited. We got a special guest, a special guest. We got Mike Wall. Let me look at these accomplishments. Mike Wall, former NFL lineman, pro bowler, played on some very legendary teams, Green Bay Packers, Carolina Panthers, Seattle Seahawks. And he is the founder of what is that? Process to Perform, a platform built around solving issues. Man, I've been Dude, I'm I'm so excited. So excited to meet you today, man. You're such a cool dude. I wanted to use that dude as like really long theatrical intro, but we we're having such a good conversation. I wanted to go ahead and and get this started, man. Welcome to the show, brother. Yeah, Tony, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. I love the uh, I love the energy, especially on that intro, man. It's insane. It gets me uh, it gets me juiced up. Uh, that's good, man. That's what I that's what I want, man. That's what I want. Um I was doing some some research on you and you played on some freaking legendary yeah. teams, bro. And like, like, how does that, how does that feel being a part of like a really big part of, of history? And you've, let me preface yeah. this with this. You are one of the legends. Every time I Googled your name or I saw anything, it was legend, legend, legend. One of the best offensive linemen of all time. Like, how does, how does that feel? Well, I think that's all subjective, you know, <laughs> depending, depending, like, I, I'm just, unfortunately, I guess for me, I'm just like a husband and a dad at my house. That's all I am. Um, but when you're at, when you're in those buildings, like I was starting to start with the Green Bay Packers or even go back further, even with the Naval Academy, like you have a responsibility to the people that have gone before you and the people that are in that building that have worked their entire lives, especially when you start thinking about professional athletes and all of the history that, that goes into becoming a Green Bay Packer, all what that means, what that means from the '60s Packers, the Lombardi era, what that what that means to to the Brett Favre era, now the Aaron Rodgers era, and, and and Mike Holmgren, all these guys that have been there, leaders, people that have absolutely sacrificed so much to get where they want, like had that plan, had that process in place, did everything they they needed to do to become the success that they are. So you feel that responsibility, and and you look, and hopefully you look forward to that responsibility and, and try to kind of live up to those standards. I, lo I love what you did there, right? And that's really indicative of a leader. I, I was giving you all the praise, giving you all the accolades, and you bounced it back on the people that came before you. What's what's up with that, man? Well, I, I just think that I think you have to have a sense of history when you go into a lot of buildings. In a, It could be in any workplace, I suppose, but it's like, Tony, who, who are you always trying to represent when you go somewhere, right? You're trying to represent yourself and your family. You know, yeah. we always say in the NFL, you say, hey, man, that name on your back, more, probably more important than the name on, on the front, right? Because you, you got you got a legacy on the back. My, that wall means something to me. It means everything to me. Yeah. And so those all those all those people you're thinking about from that perspective, that's one thing. But then when you look at you get to go to a storied franchise and the traditions that they have, the locker room that you walk into, the confidence in preparation that those those leaders, those Reggie Whites, the Roy Butlers, Brett Favre, Frank Winters, Mark Chamaris, all those guys that had that conference and teach you what it means to be a tough guy, right? Like we don't have to, like the Green Bay Packers, when you get there, 
when I come out of the Naval Academy, you don't have to manufacture emotion to be good in the NFL. If you work, if you, hey, we kick ass, we work hard, and we love doing both things. And if yeah. you get that mentality down, I mean, you don't have to be that manufactured emotion, banging your head against the wall, tough guy, man. You just, you just like doing those three things, and you like spending time with your friends, and you can, you can be really, really good doing both. Is it? Yeah, uh, the Green Bay Packers, man, they're so storied. Isn't it like a 10-year waiting list just to get tickets to, to go to oh, one of the games? So, so I think it's – I'll be honest with you. I think if you put your name on the waiting list for season tickets when the day you're born, which is what, what happens in Green Bay, I think by the time you're like 42 years old, you get tickets. Wow. That's how, I'm, that, yeah, that's how crazy it is. Wow. Yeah, and there's people when they get tickets, they, they start crying. I saw people pass out because <laughs> – <laughs> because they got the opportunity to be able to to pay for some season tickets. Um, when you first, when you, well, let me, let me rewind this. Your life uh, before going to the, the, the Naval Acad Academy mm -hmm. and before going to the NFL, what, what did that look like? So I grew up in a small mountain town, Lake Arrowhead, California, uh, San Bernardino Mountains. It's kind of the, it's a mountain range, uh, I guess between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. So you have to go through the Cajon Pass and you Southern Mountain. It's a it's a small we had one stoplight. We're like that. We're division eight football, one being like the big football league. We're division Damn, I didn't eight. know they had division eight. Well, it was just because why would they? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but, but, but we were division eight, you know, and and uh, uh, uh honestly at the time it was a terrible program. We were never over five hundred the, the all four years I was I was playing at Rim. Um, you know, when I look at like when I have conversations with all my friends from the Naval Academy and all the guys you met in the, in the league. I think I'm the only guy that I ever got that far would never be in a, you know, over 500. And we were only 500 once. So it's, it's one of those places where, you know, small community, you got to drive 40 minutes to do everything, but um, close knit group is you're always going to be that big fish in a small pond. So for me being a three sport athlete and, and kind of being able to excel in a smaller, I think a smaller tank, I think that helped me over the long run because you just get to keep trying these new things. You're always on the field. You're always getting reps. You're always getting opportunities. And, um, you know, that's something now, you know, I have kids that are playing soccer and they play soccer at extremely high levels. And it's like, I try to tell them if they're struggling, I go, you're not competing against like the, you know, the 13,000 rim of the world community. You're competing against the, the 3 million Austin community or the, the, you know, the 30 million greater Texas community. It's, it's different now. It's just the, the sporting world is different than it used to be, but, I was very lucky to be raised by by two parents who I think were teachers first and and kind of instilled those ideas in me how important school was. Being a student athlete was kind of what my responsibilities were and and um, yeah, just very very life is. I almost feel, sometimes feel like I was Forrest Gump going through life. Like some some things just happened to me that you know probably shouldn't have. <laughs> look, but, you just um, show up. You just show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. In some of the greatest speeches in the world, and you're just looking around. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, for real, for real. Yeah, uh, that, that's awesome. You and I were talking uh, before about uh, life after uh, playing the game, and I was just kind of marveled by you and your career because the things that you're doing right now is amazing. And you know, we we're talking about the parallel between, uh, like, I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, you went to Naval Academy. So I'm no, I know you, you're probably still, like, really involved in the military community and you see there's a similarity between the two to where after they get out there's something missing and they start going downhill whether it's drugs whether it's alcohol uh certain mental uh things that they go through can you speak on that a little bit yeah like we were talking before tony i, I think we both agree that that structure and, and purpose are things that are prevalent in the military and then obviously in, I think in professional sports and probably most competitive endeavors. And you can't really be successful in either one of those communities without having a real point of passion about who you are and where you're at and having a, a, a routine that creates the habits that are going to help you be successful. And when those things are no longer there, you know, we always talk about planning, right? Well, planning is really the enemy of distraction and when you have a plan when you have a purpose that's when you can stay on task and, and stay continuing to move forward and gaining momentum and, and it's just really difficult you see this all the time unfortunately with ex-military 
and ex ex professional athletes, they don't have that plan anymore. They don't have that purpose, and they certainly don't have that routine that they were they were forced, you know, sometimes forced to stick to, and it becomes very problematic. And yeah, that's why I think there's there's so many great communities, especially in the military. I mean, there's some military community. There's so many people out there now, friends of mine, that are job placement and just trying to make sure these guys are are getting on the right path because. Um, you know, oftentimes it kind of been probably a, bo a broader topic, right, Tony? But we don't do a very good job. We do a great job of saying we love our military. We don't do a great job supporting them when they need the, the support the most. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said that um, about purpose because that's one of the things that I think that we lose when we step away from something so great. I remember being in the military. And actually being told that the, the future of this country depends on you. And I know that you were told this, the same thing. You have this legacy that is so much bigger than yourself on your shoulders. So you have got to get your butt in gear to, to make it happen. What happens when you wake up and you don't have that purpose, right? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure that you have friends that, that lose that purpose. What's some advice that you give them to, to find it or, or do you, or, or are you active with helping them even before they even get to that point? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think generally when you transition out of anything and some people, you know, look, some people look at, at retirement from one or the other as a stepping stone to something bigger and better. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, and you kind of hope that in some way, in some form or fashion, that when everybody decides to remove themselves from a career, it's because, they're at peace and they want to go on and do something else. And I think a lot of times, especially I can tell you on the, on the professional sports side, the people that I know that have the biggest um, withdrawal issues are those that are, are kind of have regret. And the regret stems from either A, they left before they were ready because they were forced out because they didn't necessarily, maybe they were injured or more often than not, they didn't put themselves in a position to to make their own decisions. They put themselves in a position through their actions, their routines and their habits that allowed other people to make decisions for them. And I think that's one of the worst regrets you can live with. But once you get there, once you, once you leave, you decide to move, move on. I think the question is, you don't necessarily need to replace that like for like, but you do have to find something that you're passionate about that motivates you to get up every day and get, get your head off that pillow and get moving. And yeah. certainly Tony, I, I'm sure you agree with this. Like, structure of some sort, whether it's getting up early and, and making your bed again, whether it's getting up early and working out and getting a cup of coffee before you get moving, whatever that is, starting to put those little pieces of structure back into place. So you have some semblance of what you think is normalcy, I think is a, a huge help for, for men and women getting out of either the military service, professional sports, or either really, again, any competitive endeavor. Yeah. Or just retiring, just retiring period, man. There's so many people uh, that I've, that I've known, especially like in the fire service, police, or just construction, they retire and then two weeks later they're freaking dead, right? Yeah. <laughs> because that's what that's what they did. Their whole life was was pretty much work. I know with you as far as transition, I was reading that when you left the NFL, it was because of of an injury. So it sounds like you had already did some work prior to you getting injured to where you could be able to set yourself up to for success right well when i when i um it was interesting tony when i i hurt myself initially it was my ninth year in the league and i'd kind of played through some broken hands and concussions and kind of sprained knees and all that before but when i blew out my shoulder You're the first time that's tough that? that you played no, I mean, through broken played, hands. You know, i'll be honest with you back then it really wasn't tough I, now we think it was tough but you know it's all it's all a context of, of when you played the sport when we played the sport back then you just played. You, you didn't have a really thought. You didn't really think that much about yourself. We didn't have this kind of branding power that we do now. So we just played. We just like playing and we just kept playing. We didn't really think about tomorrow, maybe as much as we should have, to be fair. Dude, but, that's tough. This microphone fell on my hand earlier and I was like, <laughs> ah, I got to go to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, funny. it's funny now you guys will, you know, guys will like, uh, yeah. They'll stick their ligament in their thumb or something. And they're like, oh, you mean like this? And they're like, yeah, we're getting surgery next week. Like, oh, okay, well, yeah, they didn't give me that option. But it's just like I said, times are different. Um, when I got out, I was I was lucky in that I think I had a career that I was proud of. Um, 
I had always, I wasn't always, I made a lot of bad decisions, but I always felt like I didn't really leave a lot of stones unturned. Mm -hmm. I was very satisfied with where I was. I was no longer able to perform at the level that I was comfortable with. And I, when I, that last year with the Seahawks, I blew up my shoulder again. Idzik and those guys, they asked me to come back because of, you know, I, I think I was a value to them just from being around from a locker room perspective, even though I was not playing at a level that I thought was, was winnable. And, you know, you get to that point, I think, when you're playing at a very high level, I think you get to a point where, like, I, I just couldn't live with myself if – if I got like Matt Hasselbeck, my quarterback hurt because I couldn't do the job. I just wasn't capable of doing it anymore. I, me at 50% or whatever it was, I just wasn't comfortable being that, that guy. I'd rather just retire. And so I, re, I was kind of at peace when I retired and you still don't really know what you're going to do, but you, you do have, you do start having a bucket list of things that you want to get done, or at least directions that you can start moving into, whether it was for me, you know, I started um, getting my series licenses so I could, you know, start, start trading, working in, working in finance. I, I, um, I immediately went out and got the best thing I ever got probably was my, uh, my uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist uh, certificate from the NSCA, which is something I, I've been training athletes and have been in, like, that was such a huge part of my life. That preparation was such a huge part of my life, uh, even beforehand that just getting that felt really natural and just allowed me to kind of, um, be a little bit more of a thought leader on that area. So, you just start throwing some stuff against the wall. It doesn't, it's not necessarily about having a, a defined like plan that on day one, but it's like, like we talked about before, be curious, go find some new opportunities and just see where they lead. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. Curiosity. I, I thought that that was pretty cool that, you know, we were talking about being curious and I, I think that's important, especially with transitioning is important. You know, if you're just in the job, you could just tell the difference between somebody that's that doesn't have any curiosity you could the same plan every single day they do the same thing from the car to the desk from the desk to the bathroom from the bathroom uh to home you could just you could just sense that there is no uh curiosity out there is there anything that you've done to where you're like hmm i wonder if i did this and then boom it works God, I could tell you uh, probably a couple that went that way. And I could tell you a lot of times where I, I have this curiosity and you, you know, my dad always told me this, he said, listen, you're going to have 20 ideas over the next 10 years and, and 19 of them are going to suck, but you're going to have to do them. You're just going to, you're going to have to go do them. And the one is going to make it all worth it. And so I, you know, I, whether it was trying to start a, a you know, I was trying to start, start a, uh, like a sports technology company kind of before the technology was available. We tried to start an AI, you know, we've been kind of messing around with AI and sports analytics to, to better improve the way that we go about teaching technique on athletes. And I don't, I don't necessarily know enough on the AI side to do it. So we, we just continue to slowly and slowly keep learning. But there's just these, there's just these things that when you have a passion for helping other people, for helping athletes in particular, in my case, like really try to help athletes reach their ceiling, you start seeing where the cracks in the, in the armor are and you just try to start filling in those gaps. And, and once you see an opportunity, it's like you almost, it's like you can't sleep at night unless you're compelled to go figure out and see at least if you can make a dent. Yeah. I like that. So it's almost like, like you become obsessed a little bit, right? Well, I think there's a little bit of, you know, listen, you didn't get to where you were being calm and, you know, calm and cool all the time. I bet your, your foot's shaking just like mine is right now. Yeah, dude. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> obsessed, bro. Like obsessed, obsessed with the process, dude. While we're like, I'm not, I, I'll be real with you. Um, before we started, I'm looking, I'm want to make sure my camera is right. I'm like, man, I want that light over there to be Amber. I want this one to be clear. There's too much freaking head. Yeah. Obsessed. <laughs> obsessed. Yeah. It's, it's, and we all have, it's funny. We all have, um, you know, like my wife always, there's, there's certain things in life. I would say you, you hear that, that conversation or that statement that, um, it, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Right. I subscribe to when you love something, when you love something, the way you go about that, like the way you do that part that part of your life is the way the whole thing's going to look. So the, when things you love, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And, and I, I've always, you know, I've always had, you, you find deficiencies in your own personality and I'm not maybe as like, you just talked about those lights and 
for me, it's like the conversation is all that matters. It's not the presentation. And you're smart enough to know, man, the presentation matters a ton. You know, you know what I mean? So we're all kind of just learning and growing. But again, that's just that's just part of what what makes this so much fun. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that is different perspectives, man. And I'm definitely loving this conversation. I have to ask you, this has been my lifelong question about uh, offensive linemen. There's a there's a trend, man. Is it true? There's a two part question. One, is it true that y'all have to like weigh a certain amount, like 350 and and above? Two, is there like a like a rule whenever you get out of the NFL that you automatically drop a hundred pounds? Because I'm looking <laughs> at you, bro. I'm looking yeah, at man. you, and I remember when Jeff Saturday. It seemed like Jeff Saturday retired. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, dude, he was freaking skinny. And I'm just like, what the hell happened? So is that a rule or what? So the so the first one, I'll tell you a, kind of a funny story. So I was always playing. I played at 295. And not a, I was not a big guy. Strong. I think I was pretty strong. I think it was very powerful. But I, I was not big. I didn't have a lot of mass. I tried to keep my body fat at, a, at kind of a, a normal level. I had my the worst year I ever had in the NFL my offensive line coach came to me in the preseason or, you know, in the off season. And he's it, at the time, it was like, if you're six, five, six, six, you have to be 315 pounds. So he came to me and there, we want you at 315. I said, well, I'm, I'm 295 right now. It seems, it seems excessive. But so I went and Tony, I drank two gallons of milk every single day oh, for the entire God. off season. I squatted like four days a week. And I got three, I was up to 300. I probably was, you know, 313 pounds. I'd throw a water bottle in my back pocket when I weighed in to be 315. <laughs> it was the abs. It was, I got benched that year. It was the worst year of my career. I was a terrible football player. I couldn't move, couldn't do anything. So I got back down to 295. Now, so they want you, they see one good athlete with a huge frame, big bone structure, growth hormone head, you know, that head that's like, twice the size of mine just naturally you know what uh -huh. i mean like uh -huh. the guy can't do anything like steve hutchinson walter Jones. You want like a head like this yeah there it is you, it's right there <laughs> you see some of these guys walking down the street there you're like man you, it's like you couldn't be a teacher uh like a phone salesman like you're gonna be a football player that's all you could do with your life like i had options because my bone structure is not that big i i got a small you know i'm i'm, I'm just a, a a slightly above average size person that was eating 7,000 calories a day and lifting like a madman to keep that weight on. Damn, 7,000 calories? Oh, Tony, I, I mean, we two pounds of meat, a meal. A meal, two pounds of meat. It was, it was insane. It's a, it's a full, it, that, that was, that's like, that's like a, that's a job in itself. Wow. So, but to your, to your question, the second part, you know, it's funny. I, I have friends that have gone, I, I would say this, you're around, everyone's kind of around 300 pounds. And generally speaking, I think most guys either go up or down 50. Right? I got some friends that went up 50 and I got some friends that went down. 50. But I don't have a lot of friends that suck around 300 pounds. I might know one guy that kind of stuck around 300. So it, it's now is kind of the trend, right? Like nobody wants to listen. If, if you're not getting paid for it, walking upstairs in a full sweat don't really make a whole lot of sense, right? Oh, uh, yeah. 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 No, I hear you. I hear you there. That's so that, that makes sense. So my. I guess the answer to that is, uh, yeah, y'all trim down so that you could be able to walk up a full full flight of stairs without. Yeah, it's really that easy. It's really that easy. You just you, you walk up every once. You know, it's it's like if you lose fifty pounds and it, you remember the best shape you were in as a marine. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's hard to maintain that shape, right? Uh, the first year. <laughs> yeah, but but, but, it, but it's like if you ever remember how that felt, like we were none of us, most of us at least weren't. 300 pounds when, when we were 12. Right. So we kind of know how it feels to feel like, Oh, my joints don't hurt. Oh, you know, we want to get back to that at some point. Wow. Yeah, man. I, I, I got to ask you this too. Um, hands down, who is the best leader, the best leader that you've ever, whether it's played for played with, or just in and or in your life. Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I thought for sure you're going to say Brett Favre. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose you could say Brett. He's, he's definitely, yeah, let me tell you uh, the thing about Brett is Brett had a way about him 
that allowed you to feel comfortable. Mm. You could be in a really serious situation. And first of all, ultimate competitor, extremely smart. Like he's got the hillbilly, you know, accent. He's kind of, you know, he's a very affable guy and makes a lot of jokes. Guy is ridiculous smart. You know, it's like athletes have genius level brain function in a different way. Right. But he is an, ex- because of all the things you can do physically and, you know, spatially, et cetera. He's an extremely smart human being. He could have taught a you know PhD course on, on how to run an offense. But the thing that, again, I've, I brought, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. The thing that Brett gave me that I think was maybe the most important was that the understanding that if you worked hard and you, and you prepared the right way, then you could show up on a Sunday with extreme confidence and you didn't have to manufacture any of that emotion that I thought we had to just because I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm watching the wrong movies when I was growing Come up. On, like the, the rah, rah, that. that yeah, exactly. Movie, but, you, you can yeah. just go out. You can, it's okay to just be good and have fun being good. And you know, if you want to smile when you're talking trash, you don't want to talk trash at all, you, whatever it is you want to do, you can just have your personality come out because you're so confident. And that's what I really, I think, took away from Brett more than anything else is you have that kind of confidence. You can just be exactly who you want to be. Wow. So, so I got the the fact that he was authentic, the fact that he allowed uh, you all to be comfortable because I know there's a lot of quarterbacks. They, they're kind of assholes, right? (laughs) Well, you said it. No, (laughs) no, I I think most, I, I think it would be very hard. I think now you see that, listen, it's a different game now, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, brand awareness that these athletes have is completely different than 20, 30 years ago, completely different. And so you're going to have guys that are really worried about how they, how they present all the time. They they have camera crews following them. They're worried about their legacy. They're, they're actively talking about these things all the time, instead of just focusing on what matters the most. Like I, it's, it's always interesting to me, football is maybe more so than any other sport because it's such a real team sport that, and the Patriots have showed this over and over when you're successful, the camera crews show up, the sponsors show up, the social media Mm -hmm. followers show up, the pro bowl votes show up. Everything you want shows up when you have success and everything else that you're doing, you know, it's like you have, you start every day with your tank full, hundred percent brain power, whatever energy, and if you're spending, if you're wasting emotional resources, physical resources, chasing something that really isn't going to move the dial, which is what honestly was a lot of we, us do, you end up, you might get, you might get the following that you want. You might get the TV, but you might not have the career you could have had. You might not be the player you could have had. And when it's all said and done, those are the guys that call me and say, I wish I would have given it more because it was, it was the thing I wanted to do since I was six years old and I could have given it more and I didn't. And that's a, that's a shame. Wow. So do you, do you think that the personal Brandon kind of hurts that the, the whole getting ready and, and, and given your all, do you think that that's like, that, that is more of a distraction? Uh, I want to be careful when I say this, listen, there's time in the day to do a lot of things, right? I just think that when you insert yourself at a higher place than the team, especially in, 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 in football, Right especially externally, like when people are having to talk about you for the wrong reasons, when people, when you're saying controversial things uh, that are, that is just really solely there to promote yourself. I do think like, you know, I, I, I'm not a, 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 I'm not a, a religious guy, but I do think there, I believe there's some, there's some karma and there's some kind of like cosmic spirituality involved that you need to, you, you want good vibes only. Right. And so I do think that, that, there is a there's kind of a correlation between people and the amount of stuff you see them do off the field and their performance on the field. I think there's very, very few athletes who can maximize their abilities on the field and also capture everything that it is they want to ambition wise off the field. I think that's just a very, very difficult thing like you. You, know, you, you can't have two masters, you know, you, you got to be focused in on that thing. If you really want to be the best. Wow, man, that's well said. <laughs> well, well said, well said, man. I, I love that. You said that um, in doing some research on you, I didn't, I didn't find usually when you're looking up somebody, you'll, you'll find 
a scandal or something like I didn't I didn't find that with you, man. No, no scandal. What, what, well, what's I'll tell you, I'll, I'm not I'll saying you the that truth. there should be a scandal. No, I hope that's not. that's kudos to you. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I listen when I when I left the Naval Academy, I left it under a bit of you know over a dark cloud uh, for sure. I, I made some I made some uh, I made kind of multiple errors in judgment at that point in my life, and what when and and just and some some bad decisions. And and when that happens early in your life, you know sometimes you get a chance, and you're very very lucky. And what I realized very early on in my in my NFL career was. I'm never going to put myself or my family in a position where, you know, I have to have my mom or my dad look at me like they're disappointed. I'm never going to do that to my wife. Uh, you know, I'm never going to do that to my kids. And um, again, I, I was, it was pretty easy for me. I really, really liked playing football and I really wow. love, I love preparing to play football better than, than playing football itself. Cause I thought that's where I could differentiate myself. And so I would go play, I'd go prepare. I told you before, I'd go home and hang out with my wife. I had some I had some close friends I loved hanging out with. I wasn't really about the rest of it. You know, I, there wasn't a scandal to be had because I wasn't anywhere you wanted to see me. So so it, it, it made it kind of easy. Oh, I, I think that says a lot about you. It says a lot about your upbringing, your parents, and what it is that, that you want in life. I think that that is, that is amazing. I, I did read that, um, that you, I know you are about your paper. Your finance. That's one thing I did see where I think you held out and the coach didn't talk to you for about a year or something like that. And you said that that you kind of regretted it. But I out loud said, no, man, why would he regret that? I, I don't say, I don't see nothing wrong with that. I think Mike regretted it. So that was Mike Holmgren. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't regret it. I mean, listen, I, I was, I was, I got drafted in the supplemental draft. I had this agent that, you know, Neil Cornrich, he took me in and, and said, you know, here's what we're going to do. I want a three-year deal instead of a four-year deal. And so basically we held out. And when you're in supplemental draft, for those that don't know, that just means you're going to miss like all the, the, the pre-training cap, you know, mini camps and all those things. So I had never put on a Green Bay Packers helmet. And we finally ended up making the deal work about three weeks into training camp. And Mike showed up and, I showed up on the field. And I'm I'm happy as I, you could be, as you can imagine. My first day as a Green Bay Packer, and he came over, and and I got berated, and then I, you know, that practice was kind of like I was going to get, you know, manhandled by every single defensive lineman and all these things. And I got, I, you know, kind of get what you're, what, what's coming to you at that point. I think later on, what actually happened uh, w- with Mike is he had Steve Hutchinson in in Seattle, who was a first round draft pick, and ended up being a Hall of Famer, amazing player. And I think they went through the same thing. And Mike made the comment that you know somebody sent me the article and said. I made the mistake of, with Mike Wall of, of of holding this against him and not letting him play this first year when he could have helped our team. I'm not going to make the same mistake now. But, um, you, you know, those those are just – it ends up – at this point, just ends up being more of a funny story than anything else, right? Because, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, le- legendary coach. One of the greatest coaches of all time got a beef with you because you're trying to make sure that that you're setting your family up the right way. I Yeah, I, I think that says a lot about you, and it says a lot about – uh, the, the strength in your character um, be, look like we're a little bit over. You got a little bit of time, maybe two or three minutes. Sure. All right. Yeah. Uh, process to perform. You want to tell me a little bit about that before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. I, um, so it, during COVID, it, first of all, I guess to, to back it up, when I went back, I went into finance after I retired. And I just had this itch to play, to, to be around football, be around sports, be around athletes again. And you kind of find your passion. And I went back in. I was lucky enough. Joe Philbin was coaching the Miami Dolphins. I went down there and I, I started helping coach him with the tight ends. I became a performance coach. I told you I had my CSCS already. And I started seeing this new generation of athlete coming in. And I'd probably had it. I had probably experienced it from the player standpoint, but you don't really see things quite the same way. And I started noticing that there were these really good athletes that were coming in that were never gonna never gonna make it. They were never gonna reach their ceiling. They were gonna be what they wanted really to be since they were six years old. And as I looked at it, there's this tool set that I think it takes to become elite. Mm. And when I left, I ended up kind of moving on and I wanted to start this own business of working with pro athletes down to preteens and really helping them and their parents understand if you're one of those athletes that wants to, you know, go from high school and, and, and go play in college. Maybe you want to make, you know, go from college, go to the pros, or maybe you want to get that huge next contract. There are, I think, a very specific tool set of attributes 
that if you focus on and you foster and you develop, you're going to give yourself the best chance to reach your ceiling, find that next level and have the success in the career that you want. It's not a guarantee, but again, we're trying to set ourselves up for success. And so that's why I, I created this total athlete development platform that really focuses on, on three things, mindset development, technical mastery and ownership decisions, which are just lifestyle decisions in the best interest of future you. So we do that. We do a, a process to perform podcasts as well for players, parents and coaches interested in kind of having that discussion and, and going through those motions. And again, it's really just all about I have such a passion for helping athletes reach their ceiling. And you this kind of expands to anything in any competitive endeavor endeavors. I'm sure that you you recognize it with, with your storied background now and all the people you can go out and reach. All these things are really interconnected. It's just trying to find the narrative that works for different groups. Ah, oh, that's amazing. So so do you do you just work with ath just athletes, correct? No, well, I, I work with athletes. I work, you know, honestly, we work in, in, in the in the business environment. It's like anybody who is, you know, I see a, a direct correlation between any competitive environment, right? So I look at confrontational sports as something that we can really hone in on specifically with our process to perform. But I also look at really any competitive environment where you need to put in time developing a skill and having a process and forming routines and habits having a purpose, having that plan to, to avoid distractions, those things, right, are all part of the same group to me. So it, it's just, again, trying to find that narrative of, are you a salesman? You know, are, are, you, know, are you a lawyer? Are you, are you a professional athlete? How can we help you the best? How can we make you the best version of you? Wow, that's good, man. That's, that's really good. I think, I think we all need to get, could stand to get better on our processes. That's definitely has always been, one of my weaknesses, man, when I first started this podcast, I'm like, I'm just going to start a podcast. <laughs> I'm just going to start reaching out to people. I'm going to start doing, oh, I'm going to do this now. This is what going to be, there's no process, right? There's no process. And I noticed that when I started putting in some of those check systems, things started getting better. And I'm just like, oh man, this is, this is getting easy. I'm able, I'm more able to enjoy myself now instead of stressing out about, you know, all the different things that I'm doing instead of concentrating on a, a, a process for success. And it sounds like uh, that's what you're doing. You're setting these athletes up with a, a process so that they could be successful. And I think that that is incredible. Well, just like you said, if you have a process, what is and what is a routine and a process really help you do? It helps you stay present. So you can be the your, your best you in that moment. You know, you're not worried about what's next, what's going to happen next, what what happened with, with your last meeting. Having these routines allows you to stay present. And when you're present, you know, if we even if we're just talking about from a you know a flow state, if we're talking about how your how your brain actually functions and myelin and white matter, all of these things work the best. We process the best. We're you know, our firing patterns are the are the highest when we are engaged and present in that moment. And and it's really difficult. I know it's really difficult for me as, as my personality, but I think also as an athlete, it's really difficult to stay present if I'm worried about other things. And so I, I'm sure that's what you've experienced too. We, listen, I did the same thing. It was COVID. I, I didn't know what to do. I had thoughts in my head and I had a bunch of friends that were talking about, you know, all the CTE stuff was coming up. And I, and I thought, I better get some of this information out of my head before I forget it. And I just, oh. so I started the process to perform podcast, trying to get this, you know, trying to just have this discussion with, with athletes and, and, and players, parents, and coaches. And, you know, a year and a half later, here we are. Have, um, have you had uh, a bunch of concussions? Is that something that you're worried about having CTE? Well, I'm, I'm not worried about it. And then I'm sure that with the amount of concussions I did have, we didn't report them back then. Yeah. Beyond, you know, um, and, and so I'll just say, that I'm, I'm sure that the brain plaque and everything is, is, is there, you know, the thing that happens, Tony, the only thing I would say, I, I, I feel great. And, you know, not to make light of this situation, but it's like, you know, when I forget, if I forget your name or if I'm, if I'm telling a story and I have to find a word, is it because it's me or is it because I got hit in the head too much? Like, we don't really know, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know what yeah. you don't know. So I feel great. You know, I, I'm, I try to stay active. I've, you know, we talked about it before. If you, if you stay curious, you know, if, if, if you're always kind of trying to have your mind work, trying to learn new things, whether it's a new language or just a new system or a new way of thinking, reading as many books as you can, that kind of stuff, that keeps you young one way or the other. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. And I'm, and I'm glad that, that you're cognizant of that. And it sounds like you're, you're really aware. Um, so if we got some folks, I know we got some folks that are watching this. They're like, man, I, I want to hook up with Mike wall. I want to learn some of this stuff because it, it, it is interesting stuff. Uh, where can they find you? Uh, on Twitter, it's a uh, Mike wall, 68 uh, process to perform on Instagram. And uh, my website is just process to perform.com. Those are probably the easiest ways to hit me up. All right, man. Any, any parting words before we go? I just listen, I, I really appreciate what, what you're doing here. I think these, um, I think these opportunities, not only from, you know, some of my perspective as, as somebody who's to come on and have a discussion with you, because, you know, for me, I don't know about you, but I just really love having these discussions with interesting me people. Too. And so I, I just want to say thank you for having me on. And, and again, you know, it's these, these are always, uh, I, I get, I think I always get more out of these than I give. So I appreciate it. Dude, likewise, likewise. And I, I honestly, I see why so many people that have a, a podcast or have a TV show, why they write books, because it's not about what I know. I talk to people that I genuinely want to learn something from like I really want to I've learned so much from you I'm now I'm like looking at my desk I've been writing stuff about processes I'm gonna go to your website I'm gonna check it out look at some of the stuff that you got going on because um I mean if we're not learning we're dying <laughs> you know what that's I mean so I want to that's the truth yeah, I want to thank you for for reaching out and and coming on the show dude it, it means a lot dude thank you for blessing my audience with your presence dude has, has been amazing well, thanks, Tony. Thanks again for having me, man. All right. Will you stick around while I close up? Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. All right. All right. We are done with season two. No, we're not done with season two. Done with season two, episode two. Uh, that was an incredible conversation with Mike Wall. Man, I don't know if 30 minutes is is enough is enough to have these conversations i kind of want to take it back to 45 to an hour y'all let me know in the comments what, what do you think did y'all get enough of mike waller or or, or do y'all want me to bring him back for another hour <laughs> let me know but um next week uh december 9th uh we got reggie walker i'm excited to to talk to reggie reggie is an incredible uh human being he was he's also um a former NFL player. Now he's a, an advocate uh, for all things. It's such an incredible dude. I'm looking forward to speaking with him. That's next week, Thursday, December 9th. Uh, Reggie Walker, I'm looking over here at my board because I can't remember nothing. <laughs> so I got to have a, a list right there so that I can see it. But um, yeah, if you like the show, you like the people that we're bringing on the show, you're just in love with the content, do me a big favor. Uh, go and check us out. Uh, Leaders Lead the Podcast. Uh, we're on Apple. We're on Deezer. We're on Spotify. We're on all the things. But if you're going to go to Apple, oh, no, it's over here. <laughs> what you can do is you can go ahead and uh, scan this right here and it'll take you straight to the podcast. Uh, leave me a review. I really would appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you for all the things that you're doing, all the things that you're going to do. I just know that you're going to do something special. So, Y'all take care and I will see you next week. Ooh, that was great. If you enjoyed this podcast, well, I'm sure you enjoyed it. If you're still here with us, what I want you to do is head over to your favorite podcast and streaming network and give us a download, subscribe to the channel, and also let us know what you think about the show. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you for the things that you've done. Thank you for the things that you're doing. And especially thank you for the things that you're going to do, because I know that you're going to do something amazing.